so so when whenever I face a challenge or whenever something um I I is scary or I think or somebody says no you can't do this or no that's not possible or when I face something um in terms of bullying had had quite a lot of that when I was younger and even then when I went into nursing and went into sort of different careers it was one of those things I thought actually no what can I learn from this whatever you do no matter what it is there's always one tiny little bit that you can think right okay what can I learn maybe the only thing you learn is don't think I'll do that again or maybe there's a different way of doing it and I think one of the things all of my life I did my nursing then I had Emma and Victoria then I changed my career so I've changed my career a lot so don't think once you're in a career that's it for life you can change you can adapt and I'd always wanted this passion to be a counsellor and many years ago I thought right okay when I was at school I wasn't as I said academic but it gave me this desire to learn so I learned I did an open university course I went to college I did my nursing and this is when you and were then, old, wasn't it I remember when I was a teenager you were doing this this was when yeah, you were hmm. I did the open university which was yeah I mean that, that that was quite a struggle but I did it and even now even now I am still doing training courses and I'm still doing um, lots of learning and I always look to see you know things change and develop so you're always continually developing and as a counsellor one of the things we have to do is I have to keep up with all of the theories and all of the models and you have to do CPDs which are continuing pro professional development um, and supervision so you're constantly learning but I think it's just one of those things that when you decide or you look at something and you have a passion for doing it, just follow that passion. Follow what you want to do. And as much as people say you can't do it or you haven't got the ability or you're not this or you're not that, you just take a deep breath and think, yeah, actually, I can and I will. It's looking at what you can do. Um, mum, so when you were a nurse, mum, yeah. when you were a nurse, yeah. um, what what um, did, specialisms did you work in? So can you talk a little bit about when you were a, a nurse? I know it was a long, long time ago. It was like way back in the <laughs> days. But when, but it, was, was the it was the nursing when it was the old days with matrons and the big hats and, and the big aprons. You worked on the I went in though, children's. In a I went to um, unit. I did work in a burns unit, which I found the most horrendous and I still have a memory of some of the um patients I had at that time and I, I was still a student and it's it's the most scary the most frightening thing but I think one of the things it taught me was that to have compassion and care for not only the patients themselves but the families the people around and the people who who are also suffering because of their family and their friends suffering. So the Burns unit, which was at Mount Vernon, I also worked um, at Harefield Hospital where they did the first heart transplant, which was another amazing thing. Yeah. Um, and then I I worked on on a children's ward, but I found um, once before I had the kids. I was fine, but as soon as I had the kids, I found it, it much more difficult to work with children. So I transferred and did orthopedics. But that's the thing with nursing or any career. It's about looking at what fits. And sometimes you might try something or you might go and do something and you think, oh, not quite sure about this. I'm not quite sure if that fits. So you, you, you think, right, OK, I'm going to talk to somebody. I'm going to find out. And it's OK to actually say yeah this doesn't really fit I don't really when I was doing the children's nursing I realized that actually I found it very very difficult so I did I spoke to 
the, the ward sister and the manager and said, you know, I, I find I can't work with children because of my own kids. And I got transferred. And it's OK to do that. It's OK to say to somebody, this is what I'd like to do. And then if you find actually that's not quite the way I thought it was, then you can change. Right, I've got Believe a few me. questions coming in, Mum, and then I'm going to ask you to talk okay. about counselling a bit and the actual day-to-day -day yes. stuff of okay. counselling. So um, Danielle's asked, how did you deal with people telling you you couldn't make it? I think when you're young, I think it's, I think it's quite hard because you believe it at first. And when people do put you down or there's lots going on, um, you do some somehow, you actually think that that's true. And what you do is you actually think to yourself, right, okay, what's the, you know, where, as that little girl, I looked at the family and what was good, but it was tough. And I think it also gave me that determination to prove people wrong. Because if somebody says to me, even now, if somebody says to me, no, you can't do that, unless, you know, if it's illegal, then I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but it is, it's one of those things, if, if, if there is a door that shuts, I think, right, okay, how can I open that door? How um, can I do that? I think Leah's question is kind of, you've just answered that. So did you ever start to believe everyone? And did you ever nearly give up on being a nurse? I'm pretty sure. Did you do nursing and then stop and then go back to it? That's what I, I did. remember reading in your... I did. I did. I, I started, and this was, as I say, a long time ago, I started as, um, first of all, um, I got accepted as a cadet nurse. So that was when I was 16. So I think nowadays, I don't think they do that. I think you can do a BTEC, but then you could do two years as a cadet. So I did that um, at Hillington Hospital, and I was there for probably about nine months. Um, but as I said earlier, it's one of those things where, I wasn't sure then, is this what I wanted to do? So I dropped out. Um, I tried other things, went and worked in an office, dropped out for a while. And then I think it just confirmed that, that actually I did want to go back into nursing. So I did. I applied again, managed to get in. And that, that faith and confidence in yourself, and I think that one teacher who actually gave me the drive and the confidence to say, yeah, you can do it. You can. You, you, all you need is one person, one person to believe in you. And um, even if that person is just yourself. Um, so another question from Danielle. What was the hardest thing about when you first came to London from Germany? I mean, it was quite a struggle. I couldn't speak English. <laughs> I couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak English. Um, and it was scary. Um, and yeah we didn't really have anywhere to live but because I was a little girl I was only seven six to seven years old I didn't understand I didn't understand what was going on I didn't understand um how people spoke and also because I don't know whether any of you've done history yeah um but it wasn't a good thing to be German in the 50s so there was a lot of um yeah bullying because of that yeah and that's that's you know history but as a little girl you don't know you don't understand you don't know what's going on yeah okay so, so um what what was the reason why you wanted to become a nurse why you really wanted to become a nurse so why did you i think it's something it's very difficult because i think it's something that you it it is it is a passion i don't think it's something that you do for the money it's something that you do because you want for the love of people for the love of um trying to do something and helping maybe it's one of those things where you feel as though you can give something to somebody and actually when somebody is getting better or they say thank you even the smallest thing it makes you feel better because it's almost that sort of gratitude of, you know, being kind and compassionate to other people. Um, but you really do have to have a passion for doing it. You can't do it if you just want to um, get a career and do it for money. Well, there is no money in it anyway. 
but you do have to have a passion for it. Um, um, just before we move on to your stuff about your counseling career, can you hear me, Mum? Yeah. Um, yeah you what go. do you think was the best and worst thing about nursing? Ah, oh, the best, the best. I think the best, when I think about it now, because it was a long, long time ago, is the friendships, um, being there and seeing people getting better and being able to do something. There was times, okay, when they didn't, but it was just that you could actually be there, you could help, you could support. Um, and even in the darkest days when things weren't, you could support the families, you could support the, the, the people. And I think that's... And what was I the think worst? Had, the worst. Probably the Burns I unit. I think the Burns unit was 100% was the worst. 100 percent it was it was tough and i think the one thing i learned then was if there was anything anything there is nothing worse than burns yeah yeah you've always you've always said that actually okay yeah. so there's a, a few questions coming in about your therapy so um your, co your counseling so i'm going to start with uh -huh. the, what made you change from nursing to counseling to therapy um when this was a long time ago so having the, the the children it was difficult because I was working part-time so I then wanted to change my career completely I'd always wanted to do counseling but at the time um it cost cost a lot of money to go to university so I had to find a job to enable me to actually train and I think it was it's a matter of priorities because to do the counselling training when you've got a family and a young family it is very very difficult so you have to have that interim time and I think it was just something I'd always thought about that that's what I want to do when I retire so I started training I think it's just been a passion all of all of my life um but I because of logistics because of having to earn a living and look after the kids i couldn't do it when i wanted to do okay so i'm um, looking at your actual route into counseling and therapy so how long did the th the the it take to train and what courses what do, how did you go about that what did you do to to reach the level that you're at now like when could you start seeing clients oh gosh um i had to do the, the four years but I, because I was doing it part time, if you're doing it as a university degree, um, and it depends whether you do it part time or full time, I did it part time. So I think you can do it probably over three years and then um, do a postgrad. And that's when you can start seeing clients. I, I think it took me four years before I could see clients. And I did a lot of voluntary work. So I worked for victim support. Um, and help there. I worked for Mind, which is a charity, did voluntary work for them. Um, so I was doing lots of voluntary work while I was also training. But it depends if you're doing it as a career from starting, it's a slightly different route because you can do it now through university. What was the name of the actual course? It's, it's the the, the, there's, there's so many different courses. I'm I'm a, a psychotherapist, um, and I've got an advanced diploma in psychotherapy, and I'm also a clinical supervisor. But you can go. There's so many different modules. You can do CBT. You can do. Um, there's there's. I would say probably at the moment probably about eight different modules of therapy. I'm an integrated therapist, which means that I look at, at the different models. I don't do pure CBT. Um, I look at all of them. Um, if you look at Freudian and psychodynamic, um, that's a longer, that's a longer training. CBT is probably if you went to university, they're all, I would say, depending on the models you go to, but I would say they're all at least three years. Um, and talk a little bit about how you oh, oh actually a question here 
Um, do you ever feel emotionally affected when you help your when you help your clients? Do you feel how do you cope with like speaking to clients with really difficult yeah. issues? I mean, I, I must admit, there's been some really really tough ones. But one one of the things you do as a counsellor, um, and during your training, you have to do you have to do your own therapy. So you 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 start to look at your own stuff. Um, but then you 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 have to have supervision. So I have one-to-one -one supervision and I have a supervision group. But if there's something, if there's a particular issue um, that affects me, then I will always talk to one of my colleagues, talk to my supervisor, um, work through it, because sometimes you have to understand whether the issue is something that triggers your emotions and feelings and does it relate to you and are you there's a thing called transference and are you taking the stuff from the client and making it yours so you have the most important thing is supervision and talking to somebody and i have actually if there is a client um one who doesn't doesn't connect with you and says actually don't want to see i mean i had that um not long ago only about two three months ago a client i had the first session um, and then the feedback was he didn't he, he didn't want to see me, um, didn't like the approach, and I just said no, that's absolutely fine. But it, it's you have to accept that sometimes this is not your issue; it's their issue. And if it's not you, um, I know there's been times that if you yourself are not feeling emotionally strong, you might have to say you're going to have to step away from it for a, for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, you do, you you have to have that strength. It's 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 okay to say no. It's okay to say. I think the one thing is with clients because they're vulnerable anyway. What you don't you don't reject them. You don't dismiss them. What you do is offer them help and support with somebody else. It might be that you you can say actually um, this is out of my area of expertise. Um, and then you refer them. You don't say, actually, no, you're too difficult or you're too tough. I can't deal with you because that just confirms to them, actually, I'm not good enough. I'm not worth it. I'm not um, worth it. Your bracelets. Yeah. Stop banging your bracelets on the right. table. Right. My mum wears like hundreds of bracelets. <laughs> you can hear them on the table. Um, mum, do you? So do you, do you? Or do you enjoy more therapy or nursing? I I can say what I think. Because I see it in you. Well, I didn't see you as a nurse, though. So no. I don't know. What do definitely you therapy. Yeah, definitely, I, definitely yeah, therapy. I would say that. Um, I think we've just looked at this question, but do you have to be mentally strong to be a counsellor? We've kind of addressed that a little bit. But you, but if you're feeling a bit vulnerable, you would step away and say you can't yes. see anybody at the moment. Yes, I mean I did um, a few times. I I have stepped back um, when there's been some bereavements. I stepped back, I think I stepped back for about six months, and I've done that a couple of times. You have to do that. So you broke up then for me, but I think you said you stepped back for about six months. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you, yeah so, um, so talk. I'm going to ask Danielle's question in a minute. I just wanted to talk about yeah. like the day-to-day -day of how – so how do clients find you if they need a counsellor? What do they do? So are you – are they to phone you up or like how, well, how do you I've got um there's a number of routes. I I'm on I'm on the website. Um my webpage is on Google. I'm also registered with about three or four different um agencies and I'm also registered with um what they're called is is in employee assistance. So like the NHS, if somebody at the NHS um, needs to have a counsellor, they are referred to an outside agency um, and I'm registered with them. So they check your criteria, they, you, they check that you are um, able, that you're accredited, that you can work and that you're insured. So I get them from various, either they contact me direct with self-referrals or go through various agencies. And pre-lockdown, you, yeah. you, you rent an office, don't you? And they would yeah. come to see you. Yeah. for an hour yeah do an hour session with them um, yeah post lockdown so question from danielle has it become harder since lockdown so post lockdown how does it work 
during lockdown sorry not post lockdown during yeah. um working it, it actually works a lot better than i thought because um we, we do it by zoom or i do zoom facetime or whatsapp um zoom works very well and sometimes i have clients who they can't find a private or a safe space so that quite often they'll go into their car and that's the only place that they can have a session so they'll sit in their car and i'll do a whatsapp or zoom with them face to face is better but if you can't do face to face doing a zoom or a whatsapp or a facetime is okay because you can see the person they can see you um and i think that's important and if they want just a phone call i'll do that or email but it it works it does work um do you there's a question from howard do you think everyone should get therapy so do you think it would be beneficial for everybody to to have therapy at some point um 100 yes <laughs> i think one of the things i'll tell you one thing maybe um you you can all think about is really doing starting to do a journal and writing down some of the stuff and some of the thoughts because that's what started me again to do my book because i found a journal that i did when i was about your age and i wrote down my hopes my dreams the stuff that i wanted to do the good things in life and actually that helps you because then now i look back at it and i just think wow you know that's what i wanted to do um so it's it's i would highly recommend it um, and leading on from that do you think and you because you would have had your own therapy yourself in your training how do yeah. you think it helps and affects a person a question from Malia. so how do you think therapy does benefit a person i think one of the things that i find um is that it's okay and you can understand that actually we're all just human beings we've all got these thoughts and things going on and we're not alone we're not the only ones we've all got negative thoughts positive thoughts having your own therapy helps you to address what those thoughts are and how they impact on your life and a question from me leading on from that how what's the difference between having therapy and talking to your friends about something then why would you say go to a therapist rather than speak to your friends because i think friends and family see it from everybody sees things from their own perspective and sometimes you've heard the saying i'm only saying this because i love you i'm only saying this because i'm your friend but they're saying it from their perspective when you see a therapist they've got no agenda they all they are there for is to listen to understand and to help you understand a therapist a therapist does not tell you what to do a friend may tell you what to do may advise you i think you should do this i think you should do that a therapist will not tell you a therapist helps you to understand why you feel the way you do why you think the way you do and helps you to make the decision yourself that's a good point so your job you you're you're not actually allowed to advise people are you if they say what do you think i should do you're not no. allowed to i, I would never no i would never tell anybody what to because one of the things when and even if it's a friend if somebody tells you what to do and it goes wrong who do you blame you told me to do that mm. and if it was that you know you told me to give my notice in or you told me to go and see this boy or you told me to do that you wouldn't do it a friend may tell you because they're looking at it from their perspective a therapist should never ever tell you what to do um question from mancy do you find it harder with helping people online with trying to kind of um diagnose or kind of assess what their their issue is do you find that harder online um no i think when when you start therapy the first thing you do at the first, very first session is you set like boundaries humbly. pardon i've just seen one of the students is it um is that your mum molly <laughs> <laughs> hello molly's mum yeah. <laughs> my mum this is my mum <laughs> don't people get their mums in right go on then carry on mum come on mums come on everybody join on, in carry on <laughs> 
Um, no, what you do at the very start of a session is you set clear guidelines and boundaries of what you can do, what you can't do. Um, and you also then ask from the very beginning, what is it, what brings them to counselling? And, and the question that I normally ask is why now? What's triggered? Why now? To see why they want to come to counselling. But also what I've learned is that the initial reason they give is very rarely the real reason. Quite often, it's hidden. I think yeah. I've lost all. No, I'm, all right. I'm still here. You. I'm still yeah. here you. Okay, so some more questions. And um, Fatima's question that I actually want to, was linked to what I was going to ask you. So do you think in order to help um, your clients, you have to be able to connect with them? Like, do you have to like them even and is it easy to detach from their issues so if if they're telling you things that um you kind of uh, you might they must be telling you some pretty horrendous stuff yeah. sometimes how do you detach yeah. from that and do you have to be able to connect with them i think one of the things you you don't have to like a client i've had many clients who um you you don't you know you, you i can't say i dislike but some clients, you know, you, you just think, yeah, okay. It's really about um, the connection and the client. It's the relationship. The most important thing about therapy is the relationship, that the client feels safe, that the client feels that they can relate to me and they can be open and honest. Because if a client can't feel open and honest, then there's no point in counselling because you're not going to be able to talk about the issue because they don't feel they can talk to you. Um, and I think one of the things is about being genuine, being authentic. Um, and I don't know whether you, you, you've done Carl Rogers about, you know, being genuine, being no, authentic. Do, do that if you do it in sixth form. We look at Carl Rogers right, right, and, yeah. and authenticity. Yeah. But it is, it's, it's about, I think a client knows very much if you're not genuine. You know, if you sit back and you just, I mean, if I sat here and went, yeah, okay, you know, the client wouldn't connect. You have to engage with them. Um, you have to make them feel safe. You have to make them feel that they can talk to you. Um, They're not your best friend. They never will be. That, and leading on from that, actually, so how, so um, we've got a question, how many months does it take to fully understand a person? So think about how, you, when you do CBT, the cognitive behavioural therapy, that's quite short, isn't it? Maybe six sessions. About six sessions. But yeah. uh, how long, like, what's your longest client? Oh, I've had clients, I think the longest client's about three or four years. Um, because one of the things I specialise um, in is trauma um trauma can be anything so it could be a bereavement it could be abuse it could be anything so when when you're dealing with trauma um it takes a long time and for for the client to trust you it can take i mean i've had um children and it can take three months six months for them to trust you but with cbt there's a difference because cbt is quite specific about say somebody's had a car accident and they then can't get back into a car or there's a specific trauma so you can use cbt to actually um get them back in the car back to driving and the cbt i use because i do a lot of insurance work where people have had car accidents and that's where i use my cbt but if it so was a CBT, trauma, let me just I'm just so CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy and we've yeah. learned the word cognitive it's like how you learn things so yeah. it basically means you uh, like you're kind of unlearning something so so it could be like if you are scared of snakes you yes. can then read uh, read um structure your thinking patterns it's quite good with things like giving up smoking as well because it it helps you like to change your thought, your cognition. It's, your it's really looking at, there's a pattern, and I'll send it to Emma, um, which is the thought, which starts off at the thought, which affects how you feel, which affects how you behave. And it's called the triangle of thought. And that's used very much in CBT because it's the thought that de determines how you feel, which determines how you behave and act. 
And CBT is very much based on recognizing the thought pattern, changing the thought pattern, and you can use exposure therapy, which means that you start to very slowly expose. So say if it's a snake or if it's getting into a car, so you do very gentle exercises. But CBT, um, the ones that I have over six weeks, normally, yeah, I get them back in the car. Um, and how is this asked? Is it, is it linked to like PTSD? With somebody with PTSD, would that would CBT work with them? It would, but it's a little bit more complicated because if it is um, PTSD or trauma, that's normally a deeper. CBT works very well on one specific behavior, on a behavior. Yeah, one specific behavior or an incident or a thought. Um, but with trauma, it is far more deep rooted. So um, I use a combination. I wouldn't use just CBT. A really good question from Danielle. I think this is a great question. Do you ever have to share what you have? Do you ever feel like you should share what you've been through for a client for them to relate to you? So if they're talking about something that's happened to them, do you ever say like, yeah, yeah, it's happened to to me, like to, to so that it feels that they can relate to you? Um, disclosure is a big, big thing. And one of the things to keep yourself safe is that you you do not disclose. The only thing sometimes if there is something specific um you you know you you may say oh i've got children or something like that but no you you don't disclose because this is not about you it's about them and what you don't want them to do is change the therapeutic relationship that they think of you more as a friend or a colleague because you're not you have and to you're not allowed to in that respect, you're not allowed to accept gifts or anything from them, are no, you? You have to be no, really no. careful about accepting anything. Um, a question that I have, which um, is what happens if they disclose um, some illegal activity? I've asked you this before, and this is... In, in the boundaries and guidelines um, that I set out, I say to them that everything is confidential. However... If I find that there is something I feel that could harm somebody or harm them or anybody else or is, is illegal, I reserve the right to disclose that. So at the very beginning, you, you lay that out. You have, to, you have to let them know that um, if you feel you needed to, you have the right to, dis, to disclose it. I've never, I've never, ever had to do it. Um, you have another to, you question, Mum, um, from Fatima. Do you think it is uh, is possible to ever completely heal from trauma? Actually, there is a difference because what I say to clients, it's not you can't you can't forget. What you do is you change the emotional link to the trauma. So instead of triggering you back to how you felt at the time. What you do is you change that link, that emotional link, so they view the trauma from a slightly different angle. And that's particular where um, I deal with um, childhood abuse because it's, it's about changing that and working very much with the inner child. And that's very deep work and that takes a long, long time. And I have had clients um, who have gone on actually two of them have gone on to be therapists themselves so yeah i think you can um let me just see before i come back to i'm going to go back to fatima's question that she asked a while ago do you think as much do you think as the pressure and criticism that you had did it motivate you or would it been easier in the long run if you didn't have that pressure so do you think you would have been where you are today if you hadn't had those people saying you'll never make it that's a difficult one it's a really really good question it's a difficult one i think my drive and determination um comes from from my childhood i think it was one of those things that i wanted to prove i could and i wanted to prove i was good enough whether i wanted to prove it just to myself or to everybody else so i don't know it's difficult to say because if that hadn't have happened, what would life have been? 
I honestly don't know. That's a question I can't answer, but I think it's a good one. It is a really good one. Um, what I would just thought of a question as well myself. Oh, just in terms of kind of logistics, practically, you don't yeah. have to say how much you get paid. You, you charge an hourly rate, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And and they have to say so if they have an appointment between yeah. um, 10 and I, I'm saying it's and I've got bad quality. So if it's breaking up, then let me know if you have an appointment between one and two in the afternoon. If they turn yeah. up quarter to two, you won't you'll only see them for that 15 minutes, but they yes. pay the full hour. Yes. Yes. And that's what why is that? What's that? That's about the boundaries. It's the boundaries. It's it's at the very beginning you set out your guidelines and boundaries um, and that's important to keep to keep them safe because I think it's important to have those boundaries and it's also important for your own safe you know your own self-care that you have those boundaries um, because otherwise it, it, if you cross the boundaries then it's very difficult for them because they're not quite sure you know, oh, she's a friend. I can do this. I can do that. But actually, no, you're not a friend. So if a session's supposed to end at two p.m., it ends at two p.m. Even if yes. there's, so you yes. just, it, it would definitely. Um, and have you ever felt unsafe in a session with anybody? Have you ever felt uneasy or unsafe? Um, no, I've never felt unsafe. I think one of the things they say about the room and making sure that you've got the eye on the door and. Me and Victoria um, always make sure we're like, make sure you've got a panic button, make sure you've got your phone with you. But um, no, I've never felt, I've never, ever felt unsafe. Um, I felt uncomfortable, but I've never felt unsafe. Okay, right. So we're going to end, Absolutely. we're going to end the lesson. So we can all, let's put, people put some mics on and say thank you and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B